Yule is that wee town on the A9 which you tend to speed through between Inverness and Dingwall. But in fact, it's of outstanding interest in this whole lovely northeast coast. And one of the reasons is this old priory, Bewley Priory. Now, this particular bit of the building dates from 1530, and that's the modern bit of it. And the man who restored the nave was the man who bequeathed the money to found Edinburgh University. Lovely stone. Imagine it standing for 500 years. And there probably would be more of it, but for the fact that Cromwell pulled a lot of it down to build the Inverness Citadel. a really ancient bit of the old priory because it dates from 1230. Wonderful old windows of a type that are very, very rare, the only ones of their kind in Scotland. And indeed, this is one of only three priories of its kind outside France because this priory was set up for Burgundian monks from the Vallis Collium area of France. And they came here and gave Bewley its name, Beaulieu, the beautiful place. And not many people think of that when they drive through Bewley. And not many people think about some other aspects of Bewley. Because the village itself, busy as it is on the A9, it's worth swinging off into the square. Because this square is a special preservation area. Well, this ornate monument at the side of the square commemorates the founding of the Lovett Scouts in 1900 to fight in the Boer War the first of three wars that the Lovett Scouts fought in with great distinction. And they were raised from the Highlanders, mainly deer stalkers and gillies, men who were used to the countryside, sharp eyesight, and they were recruited as snipers. Great shots. And even in the last war, where they were trained in the Canadian Rockies for mountain warfare, they served nobly, and recruits are still coming up to fight in that regiment. Well, one of the stories I love about the Scouts was when they went to train out in the Rockies at Glacier. They had the pipe band with them, and they got out the station to pipe their way to the camp. The only thing was they had never played the pipes at an altitude such as the Rockies could produce in the winter time. They wailed to a good beginning and wailed to a premature halt, and that was the end of piping to the camp. Well, Lord Lovett lives at Bewley famous commando leader. It was one of his forebears who got the kilt restored after the 45. But down in the Spey Valley, there's Jacobite memory still very much alive today. If there was ever a place for a Highland lament to be sounded, it's here at Ruthland Barracks in the heart of Badenoch. And the reason is that it was in this very spot, round these walls, that the clans mustered after Culloden, after that disastrous day on the 16th of April. The retreating body marched 40 miles here to carry on the fight. They were waiting for Bonnie Prince Charlie, and he didn't turn up. He sent a message to say, let those who can find their own way. They were abandoned. Little did Charlie know, though, he was heading for France, trying to get a ship from the west coast that he would be five months in the heather before he got away. And he would never have got away but for the loyalty of his clansmen. Well, I'm going to weigh up to the top of the barracks now to go walk around and look over Badenoch, the drowned land.
Well, these thick-walled barracks were built by General Wade, who built the barracks, in fact, in order to control this particular spot, giving access to the River Spey. Because Bednach, the drowned land, is where the River Spey floods. And the important thing here is that if you want to go south, you've got to go over Dramalburn, Dramochter Pass. If you want to go west, you've got to cross the Monaleas. And Wade built a road 2,500 feet up over the Monaleas to get down to Fort Augustus, another fort. And this was to keep down the Jacobites. Well, ironically, it was Prince Charlie's men who blew up these barracks. Charlie's troops blew up the castle on the retreat from England. They were heading north. They'd come over Dromochter Pass, and now they were into the Spey Valley. They were marching for Inverness and the ill-fated events of Claude Moore. And their route lay right up the Spey Valley. Well, the Spey is still a pretty flooded place. It happens to be well frozen at the moment, but three weeks ago, all this was underwater. But when Prince Charlie's men came here in April, that was a very, very cold spring. They pushed over to the west, as I mentioned earlier, for five months he was in the heather. And one of the men who came to his aid at that time of extremity was Cluny McPherson of Badenoch. Cluny had a cave away in the heart of the mountains, away below Ben Alder. And there, Charlie was fetid like a king. He was in very poor condition by the time he came to Cluny. Well, this is a very secret hill where Cluny made his hideout. Great spot because it faces open country and yet on a face of rock which seems to be absolutely sheer. And I've no doubt the people who passed under this rock had no idea that living up there in a hole in the ground was the man that they very much wanted. And where he lived was in the face of rock. You can see it just above the icicle. There's a fringe of birch trees. And if you climb up there, there's a hole in the ground. And if you climb down, there's a small cell with accommodation for two men. And that's where Clooney used to make himself snug. He could light a fire and the smoke dispersed over the hillside and nobody saw it. Hence the reason why he could live for nine years there. But after nine years, he felt that it was too big a strain on the clan. Not only because there was pressure on them to tell where he was, but there was a financial embarrassment because they were keeping him going and food and all the rest of it. He went to Dunkirk and he was dead within a year. And it's said that he died of a broken heart. He missed Speyside and his own clan so much. But in time, his forebears were reinstated and the Macphersons live on. But the real cage on Ben Alder lies away across the mountains. It's important not to get these two caves mixed up. Now Clooney, when he went to Dunkirk, went disguised as a priest, which proved very effective indeed. Well, the Spey Valley is as wild as it ever was, except that it gets a great number of tourists and has given rise to a new kind of clansman. Oh, well, it's a queer old country, Scotland. You would never know it was Easter, the way the snow is blowing horizontally. And the reason why I'm in this forest is to try and find some shelter. And I heard down in the village there, I'd be likely to meet a man in skis called Laurie Wedderburn, who's a countryside ranger. He goes all around the forest, and if he meets people, he tries to help them, guide them, because it's very, very easy to go astray in these great woods. Or maybe, climb up into the hills and find that you can't get back because the Cairngorm weather is probably the most treacherous in Scotland. Laurie Wedderburn, you were the assistant curator at Inverness Museum and now here you are, a countryside ranger in a great forest a thousand feet above sea level in one of the snowiest parts of Britain. Do you regret it? Not in the least, no way. No, no, this is marvellous. I wouldn't go back to my old job for anything, not now. Well, this has been a particularly severe winter. When did it begin here? Uh, I suppose the present snow started somewhere around the end of February, middle of February. Uh, we had a little bit after New Year and then it really started coming in. 
And we've had a snow cover like this pretty steadily through since then. Tell me about the good days. What's it like when the sun shines here? Oh, just now in the winter, absolutely glorious. Skiing's marvellous. It's, it's the most beautiful countryside in the world as far as I'm concerned. And even in the winter, the depth of the winter, when the sun shines and it's crisp, it's marvellous. But what is your actual job? Well, I'm employed by the estate and my job is supported by grant aid from the Countryside Commission. And my task is really to stand between the countryside and the people. Um, I'm responsible for guiding people, giving them information, interpreting the countryside to them for a certain amount of their protection in the countryside, because some people aren't all that clever about that. We believe that the countryside's free for everybody to use. We wouldn't dream of sitting counting them. Um, but we do know that an awful lot of people, particularly during the summer, use the park. So it's quite easy to get lost here? I would have thought, if you're sensible, not. All our paths are very clear, they're all signposted, and there is the odd countryside ranger around to show you the way if you get lost. And it's only when you get up in these high hills that you meet an entirely different climate. Oh, very. That's an entirely different thing altogether. Um, walking around down here and walking up in the hill, is, is a very, even in summer, is a very, very different thing altogether. Can we go and look some more? Oh, by all means, yes. yes. Fine. Now we've got some young climbers here. Let's go see. Hello. Hi, lads. Hello. How are you doing? Good. 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 What do you think of the weather? Bad. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, Rocky Mountains. Oh, you've got a way to go. You've a way to go. Where are you going now? Just on Tavimo. Is that your holiday oh. finished? Yeah. 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 We're supposed to be skiing today, but the weather's a bit off. <laughs> Can you see enough? Yeah. Did, you get any, did you get any good skiing while you were away? Yeah, one day. Yeah, one day. Yeah. One day. That's a lot. It was too wet yesterday. Oh, well, we had to well come back in. better luck the next time. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice Thanks. seeing you. Watch yourself, guys. Cheers. Yeah. All the best. Yeah. Bye. a small fragment of a vast network of snowy paths. Aye. And by Joe, I wish I had skis on today. <laughs> it's a good way to get about. Let's go and get something, yeah? Why not? Well, I think I could be doing with that job. I wish it had been going when I was his age. I would really have enjoyed getting to know these hills at every season of the year. Think of the changes in the 250 years since Clooney McPherson was in hiding. The astonishing thing is that all of us have a kind of leisure undreamed of even at the beginning of the century. Well, it's a great life for those who can find time to enjoy every aspect of Scotland. And as you've seen, even the worst weather of a hard winter doesn't keep them away from Aviemore. And yet, just before Clooney McPherson's time, the grey wolf was still roaming these hills with many another animal. And you can see some today. Where I'm sitting here now is about as far away from the sea as you can get in Scotland. I'm above Struths Bay at a height of 900 feet. And on that side of me, the High Cairn Gorns, 4,000 feet, stretching to the south, right over Ben Macdui, Bray Reach, where the River Dee rises. On this side of me, the Mauna Lea, the Grey Hills, and that is probably a less known country than almost any country in Scotland, extremely wild and that's where the river Findhorn rises. And away through to the west, the Spey rises almost opposite Ben Nevis. A very short watershed separates it from Glen Roy. And if you're travelling from, say, Perth up the A9 to Inverness, you're hardly aware as you speed up that road that you're travelling through probably some of the most varied country, not only in Scotland, but in Europe because from the base of the valley to the tops of the hills is an Arctic alpine remnant, a remnant of the kind of country that was very, very normal at the end of the Ice Age. 
And over a period of seven, 8,000 years, man has so altered the face of Europe that it's very hard to know what it was like. But here in the Spey Valley, with a lot of natural forest, wonderful river valleys, great glens, the vast alpine area, we have the second biggest nature reserve in Europe. Well, the wildlife is there, but it's very, very difficult to see. But here, around me, 260 acres of wildlife park contains probably the best of all the animals that used to roam Europe. And this park was set up seven years ago. And whether it was going to be a commercial success or not is another story. The people who set it up did it because of a belief in wildlife. And I'm going to speak to the park director, Eddie Orbel, who's going to take me around and look at some of the wildlife. Eddie, from London Zoo and Chessington Zoo and maybe some other things in between, and now the Highland Wildlife Park for the last eight years? For eight years. 71 I came up here to help establish the park, um, to obtain the animals and help um, design the cages and hope we've got them all secure. Well, I think designing this must have been a very big job in this rocky terrain. It was very interesting, I tell you that, because it's every zoo man's dream to start a new zoo. And this, I got the opportunity, and I've loved every minute of it from that day onwards. I, I, I just wouldn't want to go back south again, I'm sure. And how about these wild boars here? Well, they're enclosed. We've had to enclose them, otherwise they'd root the whole park up. And uh, you can see the mess this is in, in between the snow. Um, this happened in about two weeks, so you can imagine what they do in a year to the whole park. And they're enclosed um, not only behind this rhydock fencing, but also there's an electric fence to discourage them from tearing up the outer fencing also. Well, that animal, Eddie, I don't know whether you know it or not, is the symbol of the very first people who gave their name to Scotland. The gales from Dalreda. Well, that's news to me, Tom. Well, that is a fact. So that is definitely an animal of the Scottish Highlands, the wild bull. Very really good. Now uh, they know that they've, they've got at least something coming to them, eh? Come on then. Hey, well, Here you you this so this is the reindeer that used to live around the oh, up forest to, glens? Yes, up to about the 12th century, Tom. Yes. We're feeding them here on a concentrate, rather an artificial ah, yeah. thing we're giving them. But there's oats, um, sugar beet, pulp and bran in amongst this. But their main diet, of course, is lichen. Uh -huh. And believe it or not, these are the most expensive animals to feed in the park because we import the lichen um, from Czechoslovakia, dehydrated, and then it's reconstituted by being soaked in water overnight. And they eat something like four pounds of this a day. And when, you, um, when I tell you that they, it costs 56 pounds, it costs, sorry, 56 pence a pound, the lichen. Uh -huh. to import. They're very expensive animals. We think these two cost us in the region of about a thousand pounds a year to keep. And these are the animals that used to be domesticated? Yes, yeah, they, they still are of course in, 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 in Lapland. Um, as you know there's vast herds of them there that the Laps um, herd around the countryside looking for fresh lichens. So nearly two thousand years ago the Romans were hunting these bears? They were trapping them, yes, and taking them back to Rome. Yeah. And uh, people would be tied to crosses Stakes or something? Stakes, yes. And, um, and the bears, and the bears could bears, have them? They could tear them up and eat them, yes. Or they'd put in gladiators against them and fight them. And they were really prized, I gather, by the, the Romans. Enormously strong animals. Oh, tremendous. Um, that big fellow there, the male, Bruce, he weighs about 700 pounds. Mary would weigh about 400 pounds. These two breed regularly. And strangely enough, oh, they breed every second year because one year she's rearing them, of course, and then the following year the cubs are sent away to other zoos. And um, they breed, strangely enough, on Christmas Day. Every set of cubs, they've had four sets of cubs since they've been here, and every time they've been, on, they've been born on Christmas Day. What a nice present. Yes, and we, we've run out of names for Christmas. We had Noel and Carol, and we, the last two were Ding and Dong. And they've just gone off to Bogner, the last two that were born here. So it helps to pay the rent? Oh, yes, yes. Well, how about a drive through the main yes, sure, big enclosure sure. now? Mm -hmm. So this is a dangerous bit, Eddie, because the animals are roaming free. 
Yes, it's, it's um, dangerous in as much as we've got bison out here. They'd be the most potentially dangerous animal here. And we do ask people not to, dr to um, get out of their car or not to open their doors. They're, they're, they're perfectly safe if they have their windows open. Unless an animal approaches, then we ask them to wind their windows up. It's a very, very natural looking area. You were in a park here. No, it's a wonderful place because we get an awful lot of migratory birds um, settling and nesting in this part of the park. We have the mouflon here, which are the ancestors of the domestic sheep. They're only found now in Corsica and Sardinia, and this is where we believe all our domestic sheep originated from. Further along here we should see the, the red deer. This area here, during the summer, you'll find the roe deer are more adventuresome. They come out and um, watch the cars go by, but at this time of year we've let them go into the shelter belt at the back there to um, give them some protection from this bad weather. See the deer here oh, out yes, in the middle. We we'll go a little bit further around and see those. And these deer carry on as if they were in the wild. Yes, yes they do, yes. Having their calves. The only difference is they've got used to cars and people and they don't run like they would out on the hill. This is Scotland's largest land mammal left today. Oh, uh, that's fine. Put down the window here and get a better view. This is the Shavowski's horse, or as it's known, the Mongolian wild horse. The only relative of the horse left today, the only wild horse that you can see in existence today here. Very close to our own Highland pony. Well, yes, he's a bit nearer, I would say, the Norwegian pony. Well, Eddie, that was a really exciting tour. You really enjoyed it. Oh, I did. The animals of Europe, the wildest of them, all inside 260 acres. Mm -hmm. The ones that used to roam about this very country. It was unforgettable.